to Wine Library TV. I am your host. Me, not Big Bear. Gary, they, Nur, Chuck, and this, my friends, is The Thunder Show, aka WLTV, and this is Lead Back from, whoa, Saturday. A little weekend edition of The Thunder Show. Got a little caught up in some things yesterday and didn't want to let you down. Plus, I know we want to bump off that episode with Joanne from Rocket Boom because it's obviously a very controversial episode, Mott. A lot, of, a lot of hoopla from the Vaniacs in the comment section, and I appreciate that. I appreciate the passion. Everybody is entitled to their opinions, just like wine, just like food, just like photography, just like everything. It is all based on your personal taste, and I want you to embrace that. That is the key to the Vayner Nation, and that's why we're here today, once again. And you know, due to yesterday's show, or two days ago's show, being, you know, lighthearted, a little bit more on the fun side, because we gotta mix it up. Folks, 400 episodes, it's kinda tough to stay fresh. I mean, I would be long off the air if it was a sitcom now, or if I wasn't, I'd be the greatest show of all time. So, keep in mind. Anyway, today we're gonna do a little bit more of an education. Today we're gonna talk about a very interesting grape that I think could bring an enormous amount of thunder to the CKCs. Man, how many people do you think know what CKC means? There's a lot of new people, and I haven't explained what CKC means in a long, yeah, in a long time. CKCs, college kid crew, the ones that roll with me on Facebook. Over here, friend me up, I'm telling you. And we got questions, and if you wanna be on the Thunder Show, you can, if you ask questions and ask Gary. By the way, nobody's dissing anymore because it's all clean. They answered all of them. The thousands and thousands of questions have been answered. So, if you want to be a question on Laid Back Fridays, there's a link right over here that says Ask Gary, it takes you to Facebook. You gotta have a Facebook profile, you can ask away. And friend me up while you're there. I noticed almost like half the people that ask questions on Ask Gary aren't my friends. That makes no sense whatsoever. It's like walking into some random person's house and start eating dinner. Be like, yo, hey. I mean, it's like that kind of awkwardness. So, from me up, ask a question, and today, my friends, we will be talking about a grape called Bonarda. Now, this is the uh, Altos Las Hormigas uh, Bonarda, which is a, a very interesting little grape. Uh, found in Mendoza in Argentina mainly, um, it's on the east side of uh, Mendoza, and what I, what I find very fascinating about this wine is, though it is originally from Piedmonte in Italy, it has really found a home in Argentina. Um, some people have thought for a long time that the Bonarda grape is the same grape as the Charbono that you find in California, but through DNA tests re recently, we found that to not be true. But here's where I'm gonna flip it on you. This is a little fun fact, because this is how I like to roll. Bonarda is the largest planted grape in Argentina not Malbec. That's a big upset. That's like Buster Douglas beating Mike Tyson Mott. I mean, I don't think there's a lot of people that... Cowboys. Giants beating the Cowboys? It wasn't that big of a... I, I even picked the Giants to beat the Cowboys. They were going downhill. Romo was with the blonde. You know, anyway, here's the other key to this wine. This wine, my friends, is five U.S. bones. So a $5 wine that is making a lot of impact. Five, I mean, the, the American dollar is not even worth five. I mean, it's like so weak. I mean, what is this, like eight cents? Like who makes this, like ants? I mean, it's unbelievable. I am scared to know what minimum wage is in Mendoza, that this wine with the glass, with the cork, with the label, with the shipping from Argentina to America, with the markups of the wholesaler, I'm not even gonna get into that, that this wine is five bones. I mean, that is incredible. And I'm excited about it, especially because Bernarda has been hitting my radar. I'm embarrassed and appalled shocked and appalled even, that this wine has taken this long to make its presence on the Thunder Show. Almost 400 episodes, Mott. A lot of pressure to come through on episode 400. Before we get into the wine, let's get right to the questions. And we are gonna start with Ben Swinehart. Ooh, Swinehart, that's, a, uh, that could've been my last name. That would've been really awesome. I would've been much bigger. Anyway, I am brand new to wine. I'm a beer drinker, slowly crossing over. Come, my son, to the dark side, baby. My question is, where can I look to find a condescended pocket guide of food and wine pairings? You know, like real small. I get it. Ben, you're not gonna find those kind of answers here on The Thunder Show because I am all about different pairings, different foods with different wines. I think there are no um, really great books for this matter whatsoever because I feel that everybody needs to find themselves going into certain rules. I think there are so many more food and wine pairings out there that that are really talked about that it's almost borderline obnoxious. So what I mean by that, I mean that you really need to just make your own. I'm not kidding. Try white wines with pizza. A lot of people talk emailing me now because they're finally getting around to that episode and doing it. Um, you know, cupcakes go great with Pinot Noir, and I'm not kidding. I mean, you know, it, it, you know, 
KFC chicken. White Castle, the other day, not too long ago, I had White Castle, don't tell Lizzie and the cholesterol, the whole thing, but White Castle with Petite Verdell. Who would have thunk it? That's right. Should I address Big Bear? But, I mean, he's, he's got the big ass glass. I'm, I usually do the big ass glass on the weekends, but he's an intimidating character. I'm, I'm just gonna leave him alone. Anyway, there is an enormous potential for everlasting opportunities of different food and wine pairings that nobody's talking about. So Ben, to be very honest with you, I do not want you to get into a pattern where you're gonna read books and have these preconceived notions and get into things. Try different things, try to put yourself in a position where you can try different things. I got something for all you Vaniacs. Have a dinner party, have a set meal. We're having roasted chicken and have everybody bring six different kinds of wines. Everybody tries a little, you will be shocked and happy and ecstatic over the different flavors and components that come to your palate with the different wine and food pairings and that is what it's all about. Is that a good answer, Mom? Michelle Roth asks, about 23 hours ago, um, after yesterday's show, did you really eat some cat food? Michelle? Mott, zoom it in. We will be experimenting for you, Conan O'Brien style, a little later in the show. The Vaniacs are all pumped up now, Mott. They all razzed that. People just paused and emailed their friends and said, dude, you have to watch episode 380, whatever we are on now, of Wine Library TV. The dude is gonna eat the cat food. Cause I can't let Joanne like outshine me. That's some bull crap. Nick Taylor asks, as wine ages, this is a great question, great job, Nick. Uh, as wine ages, small amounts of oxygen, 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 oxygen seeps through the cork, changing the wine. So what happens with screw tops? This is a fundamental, massively awesome radual question because this is the big debate in the inner nerds. When I go into caves of nerdum with wine people and we're like, oh, no, 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 no Taiwan, no, HT levels, and those kind of people are really debating this issue. And so I'm very curious myself. To be very honest with you, Nick, no answer yet. We really need to see a wine 15, 20 years out. Plump Jack did screw top and corks a few years back, now like five or six on the reserve caps. That's going to be really fun to watch. The reality is that oxygen brings a little funkiness. You know, the wines start getting funky if you drank old claret, classic Bordeaux. You're always gonna get a little funky, a little sock, a little manure, a little sheep butt, you know, kind of coming through. Now, has that going to change? Is that going to change because oxygen is not gonna, and are you gonna get the freshness and fruit? Are wines not gonna really age, but are gonna keep their freshness? Will there be a time when producers are producing one cork to one cork screw, or cork screw, screw top, that could be interesting. Imagine getting a case of wine, six and six mod. You put the court, you, you age like, that's kind of cool. That was a revolutionary idea. I'm patenting that, Mott. Somebody stole Mott, link it up already. No, I'm kidding. Your face was classic. I wish we had the camera on your face. Anyway, um, great question, Nick. And now let's get into the wine and why we're here. Again, um, zoom in one more time, Mott, because we did it twice because it was so nice. The Altos Las Hormigas, um, Colonia Las Libres, Bonarda, from Mendoza, Argentina. <laughs> Sniffy sniff. Now what you're gonna see on this wine that I really enjoy is a gorgeous pomegranate component exploding. Blackberry also coming through on the nose which is extremely nice and a lot of fun. There's also a subtle like sheet rock component coming through, which makes it a little bit awkward and a little funky, which is kind of fun. But there's a vibrance, there's a youthfulness, there's a little bit of a New World bomb, Shiraz, Merlot on steroids, a little Roger Clemens action going on in this wine. Let's give it a whirl. It's a weekend show. I thought you needed that. <laughs> I wanted to say I have a dream, but I would never disrespect the great Martin Luther King that way. So, I have a hope, a solid hope, that if I could get every single human being that consumes yellowtail Shiraz to try a bottle of this wine, that the entire thought process of the way they look at wine, the opportunities out there, and the, the enormous amount of great wine under eight, six, even
even under $5 that are out there still today, God forbid the dollar gets stronger, um, I think we would have a totally different wine drinking community. This wine is absolutely pleasant. It brings beautiful New World fruit, great blackberry, get pomegranate coming through not only on the nose but on the flavor profile. Heck, one of those little palm juices cost more than this. I mean, are you kidding me? This is absolutely very well balanced. A little green tea action on the finish. Pretty rad. Um, I like this. It's fruitful, it's explosive, it's a lot of fun. It's simple. It is absolutely simple. It is a beautiful wine for the Super Bowl, for example. You're gonna have a lot of people over. This is a wine that I think would go with great with guacamole or you know, with, with you know, pizza or Domino's or cheese sticks or whatever, you know, fun food. Because it's simple, it's fun, it's vibrant. You know, you know how you have that one person in your group of friends that you say, you know, he or she, not the smartest you know, tool in the shed. However, what a great personality. So much fun to be around. Just makes me lively and happy. This wine kind of does that. I am absolutely positively excited. Now, I would love to play with this wine and hang out with it and let it you know, go you know, and be open longer and play with it. I wonder if it's gonna break down or build up a little. I kind of think the fruit is powerful enough. It's almost got like a grape ape, old school 70s commercial, uh, cartoon action component to it. Very grapey, big leaf chew even grape coming through. There's some serious good fruit here though. It's just delicious. In, in Piedmont, uh, take, they used to refer to this as a workhorse wine. I mean, it's a great foundation wine. Um, it's just easy, you could plant it, it gives you a lot of grapes. It is a, a winemaker's dream. It's why it's easy and simple in Argentina. Probably because a lot of tons to the acre is why we can get great prices on this. But I'm telling you, simplicity, but solid simplicity. You know, the kind of simplicity that is respected in our society. 86 points, 86 plus, 87. You know what, 87, god darn it. 87 points for this wine. A very good, youthful bottle of wine. 24 months, I think this would be drinking great. 36, 48, might get a little tired. You know, kind of like that party girl in her 40s. Mm, you know, but a definite wine that I think a lot of people can enjoy. A wine that is widely distributed. I hope a lot of people seek this out. I am absolutely, positively on board. Better than I even thought. And I was going in with some pretty solid expectations. That's all I'm saying. Ball Hofner asks, Gary, how do they determine the lifespan, they, I like the way he did it, of wines? I know most are ready to drink upon release, but for those that can age. Bal, I'm sorry I said Ben, didn't I? Bal Hofner, that's a great question as well. Great question today, really education. I'm happy with the show, I like the vibe of the show. Bal, great question. The way I determine, just like I did with this wine, the age of wine and what I feel a lot of wine people that have to do this do, I really am not even sure actually, but the, the thing that makes a heck of a lot of sense for me and as over the last decade or so, I've made those you know, guesses, because that's all they are. Parker, Spectator, me, uh, you know, James Holiday, everybody, Tanzer, it's guesses. Let's be honest, what, what, the wine messiahs? Come on, we're not Yoda up in this peep. But here's what I'm gonna tell you, that when you have the acidic tannin versus fruit ratio that you end with the wine on its finish and the overall weight factor are the things that I put into you know into thoughts. So it's like, okay, it has a lot of fruit, but if it doesn't have a lot of tannins and backbone, you know that it's gonna break down, it's just gonna be a flabby wine and whatever. Flip side, really, really tannic and really, really solid fruit, now you're excited. And you're gonna go along and the structure together long term will go perfectly. A lot of tannins and no fruit, will this wine ever open up? Maybe not, maybe it's just all, you know not solid that way and nobody will like it anyway. I mean, who wants to you know, drink bitterness. So um, it's the ratio of the backbone on white wines, the acidity um, versus the fruit. It's that fruit backbone. You know, it's kind of like, you know, yeah, fruit backbone, complexity, you kind of just gotta feel it out. And then when you're in a position like a lot of wine critics are, you know, when you're drinking 15, 20 wines a day every day of your life, and then you get to go back, you know, I went to a 94 Cabernet tasting not too long ago, and I got to taste a lot of the 94 cabs that I have an old school pad on and of what I thought, and I see eight years, 20 years, it's great. And so you get, you get a lot of more opportunities to test your guesses. And after a while, you understand how you guess, and so it becomes a process, it makes sense, right? It's like, how do you predict football games? If you watch every football game, you get a feel for the teams, the weaknesses. So it's that kind of thing, but it's a great question. The screw top question was great. The cat food question was absolutely the way we need to end this show with. So. What else, Mott? Anything? Should I ask a question a day? Mott, zoom in on this stuff. 
It smells like a really solid bottle of champagne. Like a good 60, you know, who needs a $65 bottle of champagne when you got this much? Question of the day. What is the best under $5 wine you've ever had? Because you, and I'm serious, it's you. You don't realize it, but you, it's you. I'm gonna ask you a question why it's you soon, so start thinking. Because of you, with a little bit of me and some cat food, we're changing the wine world.